Well, in this first video, we want to look at the fetal circulation. And if you're in the States, you leave the O out, but it's exactly the same thing. So it's the, the circulation of blood in the fetus and between the fetus and the placenta. And then when we've looked at this uh, incredible area of uh, physiology, we'll go on and look at the changes that take place during the process of birth. Now, the reason that the fetal circulation is different from the adult circulation is that the lungs, um, the kidneys, the gastrointestinal organs essentially don't function until the point of birth. So to compensate for this, the fetal circulation has got some relatively large blood vessels. And we'll see that three of these blood vessels or three of these anatomical features act as shunts, shunting blood from one part of the circulatory system to another. Because these relatively large vessels allow the majority of the blood to bypass the liver and the lungs. Now, obviously here we notice that there is a placenta. So this is the placenta here. This, this structure here is the placenta. And the placenta is bringing oxygen and nutrients from the mother. And it's also taking away into the mother's circulation waste products and carbon dioxide from the fetus. So the placenta is serving as the organ for fetal nutrition, excretion, oxygenation and the removal of carbon dioxide. It's a temporary organ, but it's an exchange organ. Now, fetal blood, blood coming from the fetus, reaches the placenta via two umbilical arteries and in early fetal life, two umbilical veins. But later, the right umbilical vein disappears, leaving one umbilical vein. So in later fetal life, there's going to be two umbilical arteries and one umbilical vein. And the definition is the same as always. An artery is carrying blood away from the fetal heart. A vein is carrying blood towards the fetal heart. So when we talk about the umbilical arteries, we're talking about vessels carrying blood from the fetus to the placenta. When we talk about umbilical veins, we're talking about vessels carrying blood from the placenta to the fetus. And that's why we're starting off with this simplified diagram, because this is showing the circulation of blood from the fetal circulation to the placenta. So this structure here that I've drawn in pink, this structure in pink is actually the aorta, the major blood vessel from the left ventricle. Now, the reason I've drawn it here in pink is because it's actually carrying mixed blood, blood that's partly oxygenated and partly deoxygenated for reasons that we'll see later in this video. Now, the aorta is coming down here like this. So this is the aorta. And then the, the aorta branches into two common iliac arteries. So we have the right and the left common iliac artery. So this is the common iliac artery here. This is the common iliac artery on this side here. And then the iliac artery itself divides into two further arteries, the external iliac artery here, and the external iliac artery here, and the internal iliac artery there, and the internal iliac artery there. And we notice that the umbilical arteries, which I've drawn here in red, going from the internal iliac arteries of the fetus to the placenta. These are the umbilical arteries drawn in red. So they're carrying blood from the fetal internal iliacs to the placenta. And I've drawn this in pink, these arrows in pink here, because again, this blood is mixed. It is not fully deoxygenated. It's partly oxygenated, partly deoxygenated blood. So that's taking this blood via the umbilical arteries to the placenta. And it's coming from these structures here, which are the uh, internal iliac arteries. There and there. So the umbilical, the umbilical arteries are actually branches of the fetal internal uh, iliac. Now, what I've drawn here, what I've drawn here, this is the abdominal wall of the fetus. So this area here 
is going to be the umbilicus, the belly button of the foetus. Now I haven't drawn the vein in here for simplicity, we've just drawn the arteries. And we actually know that the arteries actually wrap around the wrap around in a, in a spiral, in a loose spiral around the uh, umbilical vein. But we've just drawn this so we can see what we're doing, so I can understand the diagram. And this is taking blood to the placenta, and from there it's going to go into the capillaries of the placenta to be oxygenated from the mother's circulation. So this bit I've drawn from here to here, or from here all the way really to here, from, from the baby's abdominal wall, from the umbilicus to the placenta, that, is, that area is the umbilical cord. So the umbilical cord contains the umbilical arteries. And as we'll see later, there's an umbilical vein as well. So that's how the blood's getting to the placenta to be oxygenated. Via the umbilical arteries. Now next we want to think about the umbilical vein. So here we have again the placenta, just there. This is the placenta. This is the umbilical vein. And as we'll see, this is the inferior vena cava. So we're still thinking about the fetal circulation. So again, the umbilicus is going to be this area from here to here. That's the umbilicus there. From there to there in the baby's or the fetus's abdominal wall. And we've noted that the blood goes to the placenta via the two umbilical arteries. It goes through the capillaries of the placenta. It drains from the capillaries of the placenta and eventually drains back, as we've said in later fetal life, into one single umbilical vein. So the blood's draining back from the placenta when it's oxygenated. And uh, I've drawn this in red to indicate that it is uh, now fully oxygenated blood coming back from the mum's uh, oxygen supply by the mum's circulation. And of course the fetal haemoglobin has got a higher affinity for oxygen than adult maternal haemoglobin. That's why the oxygen diffuses from the mother into the fetal blood. So it's going through the umbilicus and this part from here to here that's going to be the umbilical or the umbilical cord. So the umbilical cord is going to be there and we, we've already noted it contains the two umbilical arteries. We now know that it contains the umbilical vein as well. So this structure in red here is the umbilical vein running through the, the, the umbilical cord. So this blood, this oxygenated blood, is coming back from the placenta and it's going in the umbilical vein. Now this is still the umbilical vein here, once it's inside the, uh, inside the fetus. That's still the umbilical vein. And then at this point the umbilical vein is going to divide into two. Here it connects with this becomes the hepatic portal vein and that takes blood into the liver. But this vessel here, this vessel here is the inferior vena cava. So this vessel I've drawn in blue here is the inferior vena cava running up here, taking blood back towards the fetal right atrium. So we notice that the umbilical vein is dividing into two, a branch, this goes to the hepatic portal vein taking blood to the liver. And this branch here, this small vein here, is taking blood into the inferior vena cava to join the flow of blood in the inferior vena cava going back up towards the fetal heart, back up towards the right atrium. And this small vessel here, it's one of those three shunt vessels we talked about. It's small but it's immensely significant because this is the uh, ductus venosus, ductus venosus. So just that bit there, the ductus venosus. And what that, what that is doing is taking blood from the umbilical vein into the inferior vena cava. So really the ductus venosus is an extension of the umbilical vein, taking the blood up 
into the inferior vena cava. And this is at the area of the liver, round about where the fetal liver is. And we've drawn that in blue because that's coming back from the baby's lower, uh, lower half of the body. It's the inferior vena cava. But then when it's mixed with the oxygenated blood from the umbilical vein, we're drawing that in pink because that means it's mixed oxygenated and uh, deoxygenated blood. And that's going to go back up towards the fetal right atrium. So that brings us nicely onto the next shunt vessel we need to consider, or the next anatomical structure, shunt anatomical structure we need to consider, and that is the foramen ovale. Now just by way of orientation, let's look at what we're looking at here. So this is the heart, so this is the right ventricle, this is the right atrium. So right ventricle, right atrium left ventricle, left atrium. So that means that going into the right atrium we've got the superior vena cava and as we see that's draining deoxygenated blood from the top of the fetal systemic circulation. But then we've got the inferior vena cava here and we notice that the blood from there has been enriched with oxygen from the umbilical vein. So that's mixed going up there. And this is going to go up. So this vessel here is a continuation of this one. It's going up there like that. So it's like, it's like that. That is a continuation of that vessel there. Now I haven't drawn the aorta and the pulmonary artery in here because it would make the diagram too cluttered and I would get confused. But we notice that there's blood here which is deoxygenated coming back in the pulmonary veins. And this blood's deoxygenated, of course, because the fetus is not breathing. Uh, there's two of the four, there'd be another two pulmonary veins there, bringing back from the blood back from the fetal lungs. But although it's deoxygenated, it's not great in volume because the vascular resistance in the fetal lungs is high, so a lot of blood does not circulate through the fetal lungs. These will be relatively small volumes of blood coming back into the fetal left atrium. So we notice that the blood is coming back via the inferior vena cava and, and it's mixed. It's relatively well oxygenated. Now some of that blood was going to go from the fetal right atrium into the fetal right ventricle. And as you know if you know about the circulatory system, when the right ventricle contracts that normally ejects blood into the pulmonary artery. So that will happen, blood will be ejected into the pulmonary artery. But staying with this diagram for now, we notice that this is the atrial septum here. So this is the ventricular septum down here, the ventricular myocardium, this area here. I've just coloured in the atrial myocardium here for, for clarity. I haven't coloured in the ventricular myocardium. But this would be the left ventricular wall just here. That would be the right ventricular wall. And this is the cardiac septum. And we notice that blood from the right atrium is going through this hole directly into the left atrium. And this hole, this communication, is the foramen ovale. So the foramen ovale is this communication between the fetal right atrium and the fetal left atrium. And for clarity, we notice that this is the atrial septum just here. That bit there is the atrial septum. We notice that this bit at the bottom is the uh, ventricular septum, just there like that. And we've already noted that this blood vessel here is the inferior vena cava. So we've noted that some of this partly oxygenated blood goes from the right atrium to the right ventricle. And that's going to be pumped out, as we'll see in a minute, via the pulmonary artery through the pulmonary arterial valve. But we notice that quite a lot of the blood goes from the right atrium to the left atrium. And of course, from the left atrium, the blood goes down into the left ventricle. And the blood is going through this vital communication, the foramen ovale. And when the left ventricle contracts, that's going to close this um, left atrioventricular valve. This, this is the mitral valve here. It's going to close that valve and this blood's going to be ejected out 
into the aorta, which of course is good because that's going to take blood to the fetal systemic circulation. Which brings us nicely on to the next diagram, which is this one. First, let's orientate ourselves on this, uh, on this diagram. Now, this, well, we can see clearly that's the uh, right atrium, the right ventricle. This is the, I could write that on, so that's the right atrium, that's the right ventricle. This is the left atrium, this is the left ventricle. So this is the atrial, uh, this is the atrial myocardium coloured in, the ventricular myocardium not coloured in. We have the inferior vena cava taking in the mixed blood, mixed oxygenated blood from the umbilical vein. We have deoxygenated blood coming down through the superior vena cava. So this vessel here is the superior vena cava. Now in uh, green we have the atrioventricular valves, but in orange here we have the, the arterial valves. So blood from the right ventricle is going to be ejected through the pulmonary artery or through the pulmonary arterial valve into this structure here, which is the common trunk or the main trunk of the pulmonary artery. Blood from the left ventricle is going to be ejected through the aortic valve into the aorta. And this vessel going around here is the aorta. And branches from the aorta will take blood to all of the systemic circulation or all of the fetal systemic circulation. So here we have the aorta, that's that vessel there. And here we have the pulmonary artery, that's that vessel there. Aorta in red, pulmonary artery in, in blue. Now we've noted already on the previous diagram that blood is coming in via the inferior vena cava mixed with oxygen and that some of it, yes, is going through to the right ventricle. But we also notice that other components of it here are going straight through from the right atrium to the, uh, to the left atrium via the uh, foramen ovale, which we actually can't see on this diagram. But that's good because that means that the relatively oxygenated blood is going to go from the right atrium to the left atrium to the left ventricle to be pumped out into the aorta and go all around the, uh, the fetal circulation to oxygenate the, uh, to provide the systemic oxygen supply for essential fetal life. So, so that's good. But we've also noted that some of the blood goes from the right atrium to the right ventricle, and that this blood is pumped into the pulmonary artery, here the main trunk of the pulmonary artery. This was the main trunk of the pulmonary artery. Now, do we want a lot of blood going to the fetal lungs? No, we don't want a lot of blood going to the fetal lungs because they're not oxygenated. So what happens is, here we see that they have the, um, the main trunk of the pulmonary artery. And of course, very quickly, this divides into one branch here, one main branch going to the left lung, and one branch here going to the right lung. So there's the bifurcation here of the pulmonary artery. And here we have the aorta. And because we don't want a lot of blood going from the pulmonary artery into the lungs, we don't want that in the fetal situation. What happens is there's one of these extra third, this is the third of these shunt vessels. And what we have here is we have a small vessel that takes blood directly from the pulmonary artery. And we see it's going in a straight line. So it can just sort of keep going all the way through to the aorta. And this extra vessel is just from there to there. That's all it is, just this short vessel from there to there, connecting up the pulmonary artery with the aorta, meaning that the blood is diverted or shunted away from the lungs into the fetal circulation. That's good because it gives us a larger volume of blood for the systemic fetal circulation, but it also means that that blood is already oxygenated or fairly well oxygenated. So that's that third shunt vessel. It's only from there to there, but that is the uh, ductus arteriosus, the ductus arteriosus, carrying the blood from the right ventricle pulmonary artery, but into the 
systemic circulation because we don't want the blood going to the fetal lungs. So remember, the blood is going to the placenta via the two umbilical arteries. This blood is oxygenated in the placenta. The oxygenated blood goes back via the umbilical vein, which divides into the hepatic portal vein, taking some blood to the liver, but into this central vessel carrying blood to the inferior vena cava. And that, of course, is the ductus venosus, the ductus venosus taking that blood. Again, it's only short, it's only from there to there, but it's taking the blood from the umbilical vein into the inferior vena cava. Then we notice that this blood goes up to the heart via the inferior vena cava, and that a lot of it just goes from the right atrium through to the left atrium, so it can be ejected into the fetal systemic circulation, not going via the fetal lungs. And of course, that shunting communication is the foramen ovale. And then we notice that blood that went, did go through to the right ventricle, that didn't make it through the foramen ovale from the right atrium to the left atrium, but went from the right atrium to the right ventricle, um, we notice that that blood is ejected out into the pulmonary artery, but that goes through this other shunt vessel into the aorta. And of course, that shunt vessel is the ductus arteriosus. Now, in the next section, we want to look at how these change virtually at the point of birth and very shortly after birth into the uh, mature child, well, first into the neonatal circulation, which is essentially the same as the mature child and the adult circulation. Now, having considered the anatomy and physiology of the fetal circulation prior to birth, we now want to think about this momentous event, this milestone in the human lifespan continuum, which is, which is birth. Now, at birth, the baby's going to start to breathe. So uh, pulmonary res respirations begin. And of course, these are the arteries. That's the right pulmonary artery. That's the left pulmonary artery. One taking blood to each lung. Now, as the lungs are oxygenated with gaseous oxygen from the air, the effect of that gaseous oxygen is to vasodilate the pulmonary arterial vasculature. So these arteries and their branches are going to dilate, especially the smaller branches, the arterioles in the lung are going to dilate so they can take maximum benefit of this oxygen and pick it up. That's why we have this reflex pulmonary arterial vasodilation as a result of the oxygen which is now entering the alveoli. So what this means is that more blood from the pulmonary trunk is going to go through the pulmonary arterial system and through the pulmonary vascular system. Absolutely brilliant because it now means the baby is getting rid of their own carbon dioxide, picking up their own oxygen. It's exactly what we want. But of course, once the blood has been through the lungs, it's going to come back to the left side of the heart. It's going to come back to the left atrium. And that's going to increase the pressure of the blood in the left atrium, which takes us to this diagram. So the pressure of the blood in the left atrium is now increasing. And we've seen that the foramen ovale is this flap-like structure. It's a valvular structure. It opens that way and it closes that way. And now the pressure in the left atrium is higher because of the blood coming back via the pulmonary veins because of the vasodilation in the pulmonary arterial system. So the increased pressure here is going to tend to close that flap, to close the foramen ovale, giving us a physiological closure and an intact atrial septum or a physiologically intact atrial septum for the first time in life. And as well as that, as we'll see later, there's also be, going to be constriction in the umbilical vein and constriction, uh, constriction in the ductus veniosus. What's that going to mean for the amount of blood going into the inferior vena cava? Well, that's going to reduce the amount of blood going into the inferior vena cava. And of course, the inferior vena cava goes up, connects to the, the inferior vena cava here, going into the right atrium. 
So because there's less blood going through the umbilical vein and the ductus venosus, that means there's less blood going into the right atrium. And that means the pressure in the blood in the right atrium is going to reduce. So we have a combination of increasing pressure here and decreasing pressure here. And that's going to result in closure of this foramen of Arley. And as well as that effect, there's probably some constriction of the atrial septal muscle as well that uh, reduces the size of this hole. And in fact, physiologically, what happens is shortly after birth, the pressure in both atria actually becomes equalised. Therefore, the valvular foramen of Arley closes and later it will fuse. And actually, it's, it's only uh, fully obliterated at two weeks after birth in 3% of uh, neonates. And it's obliterated in 87% of infants at four months. So basically what we're looking at is this um, healing over, fusing in the first few months of life. But this physiological closure because of the valvular nature of the foramen of Ali occurring in the first minutes of life. Now, of course, there's other vessels to consider lower down. We've looked at the umbilical arteries and we've looked at the uh, umbilical vein. Now, when the baby is born, the umbilical cord is going to be exposed to the air. And bradykinins form in the blood of the umbilical cord in response to this lowered temperature. Now, the bradykinin, uh, the kinin polypeptides are uh, hormones that control and relax smooth muscle. So when they affect the smooth muscle in the vasculature, they can cause vasodilation or vasoconstriction. And as well as that, as well as that, bradykinin is also formed by granular leukocytes in the lungs as a result of exposure to uh, gaseous oxygen. And that's going to come back into the circulation via the pulmonary veins. And these bradykinins that are stimulated by the arrival of oxygen in the lungs and the cooling of the umbilical cord have several effects. Firstly, these bradykinins will constrict the umbilical arteries and they will constrict the umbilical vein and they will also have some effect in constricting the ductus arteriosus as well and as well as that the same bradykinins actually inhibit constriction of the pulmonary vessels so the same bradykinin is going to constrict the umbilical arteries and the umbilical vein going to constrict the ductus arteriosus but they're going to dilate the pulmonary arterioles especially meaning the blood supply to the lungs is insured. So that brings us on to thinking about the ductus arteriosus now in, in a, little more, uh, a little more detail. Now as we know this in fetal life is shunting blood from the uh, pulmonary trunk to the uh, arch of the aorta up here. And this is good because in the fetal situation it bypasses the fetal lungs. And in fetal life the ductus arteriosus arises just by the bifurcation into the right and the left pulmonary arteries. And it's only about 8 to 12 millimetres long. So it's quite short really, just 8 to 12 millimetres in length. And it's very clever because it joins the aorta at an angle of about 30 to 35 degrees with a very elongated uh, opening. And this means that the blood flow from the pulmonary artery flows smoothly into the systemic circulation with the aorta. So we don't get turbulence in the fetal blood circulation. So very impressive arrangement of anatomy in the ductus arteriosus that facilitates physiological smooth uninterrupted blood flow. But of course, in postnatal life, we no longer want a patent ductus arteriosus. We need that to close off.
Just out of interest, actually, the, the ductus arteriosus, uh, when it's full of blood, is it, four to five millimetres in diameter. And considering that the aorta is only uh, five to six millimetres in diameter, we can see that a lot of blood is shunted away from the fetal pulmonary circulation into the into the fetal systemic circulation. Anyway, we're thinking about what happens at birth now. Now, the tunica media in the ductus arteriosus, the middle layer of the, uh, the arterial vessel, is largely smooth muscle. So the ductus arteriosus is short, but it's a muscular artery, not an elastic artery like the other ones. But of course, very important to keep it open in fetal life, probably kept op open in fetal life partly by the action of prostaglandins, but we need it shut shortly after birth. And the ductus arteriosus indeed starts to close pretty well immediately, or immediately after birth, it starts to close. But there's actually a bit of blood flow for about a week. So there is some blood flow in the ductus arteriosus for a, a, about a week after birth. Now, if we think about the situation here, the pressure is now going to be higher in the aorta. So whereas in the fetus, blood went from the pulmonary artery to the aorta, in the first hours of life, blood is going to go in the reverse direction from the aorta into the pulmonary circulation. And actually, this is probably physiologically useful that some blood goes from the aorta into the pulmonary circulation in the first hours of life because that's going to increase the pulmonary circulation. It's going to increase the volume of the blood going into the pulmonary circulation, which of course means that more oxygen can be picked up and more uh, carbon dioxide can be exhaled through the now neonatal lungs. But this reverse blood flow that does occur from the aorta into the pulmonary artery in the first few hours of life is important because it probably inhibits the production of prostaglandins and that will allow further constriction of the ductus arteriosus because remember the prostaglandins are dilatory and we no longer want that. So the reverse blood flow probably inhibits the release of prostaglandins, allowing that to start to close off. And in fact, this reverse blood flow from the aorta back into the pulmonary artery has probably several effects. It's believed that the reverse blood flow will stimulate vasoconstricting factors in the endothelium of the ductus arteriosus, which will also help that to constrict and to close off. And also the reverse of blood flow probably has some uh, release of catecholamine um, effects. And it's known that there's adrenergic nerve receptors in the ductus arteriosus, so that probably too helps it to constrict and of course, it's long been believed that the increase in oxygen as the baby starts to breathe, as the neonate now starts to breathe, is going to constrict the ductus arteriosus uh, as well. So there's several factors here resulting in the constriction of the ductus arteriosus. And there's actually two stages of closure that are described for the ductus arteriosus. The first stage closure um, is in the first 10 to 15 hours of life first 10 to 15 hours, and that's caused by this smooth muscle uh, constriction, this vasoconstriction. And the second stage closure occurs in the uh, first two to three weeks of life, and that's probably mostly caused by proliferation of the uh, intima, the inside layer of the uh, ductus arteriosus proliferates and fills up the lumen of the ductus arteriosus, causing a more permanent closure. So there we have the three main changes that occur shortly after birth. The constriction of the ductus arteriosus and the closure of the ductus arteriosus, the closure of the uh, foramen ovale and the constriction of the uh, ductus veniosus uh, and we could add the constriction of the umbilical vein and the constriction of the umbilical arteries. Essential anatomical modifications, all controlled by well-programmed physiological modifications, stimulated by this amazing process of birth.